coming. We're going to go ahead and get started. My name is Alexis. I'm a 1 0 representative from the Federalist Society. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce our speakers today. Mr. Uh, professor Josh Blackman is an associate professor of law at the South Texas College of Law in Houston, who specializes in constitutional law, the United States Supreme Court, and the intersection of law and technology. Most recently, he is the winner of the Federalist Society prestigious. Thank you, Chicago, for <laughs> Joseph Story Award. Professor Blackman clerked for the honorable. He's snapping a clutch. Danny Day Roggs on the U.S. Clock, excuse me, on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, and for the honorable Kim R. Gibson on the U.S. District Court for the Western District of Pennsylvania. Josh is a graduate of George Mason University School of Law. And then uh, Professor Hemmel, Daniel Hemmel's research focuses on taxation, nonprofit organization administrative law and federal courts. Professor Hemmel was a law clerk to Associate Justice Elena Kagan on the U.S. Supreme Court. He also clerked for Judge Michael Budin on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the First Circuit and Judge Sri Srinivasan on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit. Professor Hemmel graduated from Harvard College, received an MPhil from Oxford University and earned a JD from Yale Law School where he was energy. Thank you so much. Uh, it's always a pleasure to be at Chicago uh, because we're the only school where we have debates. You can tell debate me, so Mr. Hamill uh, is a mensch. We were actually here, I think November 2016, was that right? Uh, shortly before the election, we were talking about the advantages of executive power and deference. Uh, <laughs> that was a long time ago. <laughs> so today we're talking about something far more obscure, which is a provision of the Constitution that probably none of you have heard of before the last election, which is the Foreign Emoluments Clause. And I'll read it to you. It says, no person holding any office of profit or trust under them, and them refers back to the United States, so no person holding any office of profit or trust under the United States shall, without the consent of the Congress, accept of any present emolument, office, or title of any kind or whatever from any king, prince, or foreign state. Okay. In a series of coordinated lawsuits, various groups have complained that President Trump is violating these clauses. And they've asserted that because Donald J. Trump is the President of the United States, he thus holds an office of profit or trust under the United States. This argument certainly has an intuitive appeal. How could the president not qualify as an office of profit or trust under the United States for purposes of this important anti-corruption provision? But an intuition is not an argument, and it is not evidence. There is not a single decision from a court holding that this language in the Foreign Emoluments Clause, or the more expansive phrase, office under the United States, using other provisions, applies to the president. Rather, the text and history of the Constitution and post-ratification practice during the early republic strongly supports the counterintuitive view. The president does not hold an office under the United States. Seth Barrett Tillman, who went to Chicago for college, math major, really bright guy, uh, is now a law professor in Chicago. And he has written for nearly a decade that elected federal officials, such as the president, do not hold office under the United States. Um, I was persuaded by Seth's research before the election and before the notion that a President Trump was even conceivable. Seth and I have submitted a series of amicus briefs to federal courts in the Southern District of New York, the District of Columbia, and the District of Maryland. And each brief has argued that the President is not subject to the Foreign Emoluments Clause. Uh, we've made other arguments about the meaning of emoluments and official versus individual capacity. I'm not going to touch that today. Way too much to cover just with this one topic. Um, indeed, in response to our briefing, the DOJ has actually shifted their position. And now they only assume that the Foreign Emoluments Clause applies to the President. I think there will be some more shifting in the future. Prior to the election, Will Bode, your very own professor at Chicago, wrote, Professor Tillman's theory makes sense of patterns that most of us never saw. It brings order out of chaos. That is my goal today, to bring order out of chaos. 
And we'll do that in two parts. First, I will explain the Constitution's taxonomy. Appointed. Richard! Oh my god! <laughs> what am I talking about? <laughs> are you doing this also? Well, okay. I'm not debating. You know, just <laughs> I see Richard far too often. He comes, he's everywhere. He's omnipresent. He's ubiquitous. So we're doing the modeling, Richard, okay? I don't know the first thing about him in the modeling. What's the second <laughs> you, are, you are right on time, so we'll talk about it. So the first part of my talk will explain the taxonomy of the Constitution. That explains that appointed and not elected official hold office under the United States. And second, I will explain how the practices of presidents during the early republic, as well as Alexander Hamilton, serving as the first Secretary of the Treasury, confirmed that they understood that the President was not subject to foreign emoluments clause. So the first step is I want to show you a taxonomy. And uh, Seth and I have blogged about this in the Volcan first last week. But what you actually will see in this taxonomy is various phrases in the Constitution, which you never consider. The Constitution speaks of officers of the United States, office under the United States, office under the authority of the United States, and public trust under the United States. Um, most of you probably assume that these phrases are interchangeable and that there's no difference between one and the next. Uh, by the end of my talk today, if I persuade you of nothing else, you realize that there are different meanings. Even if you don't agree with me that the president is not subject to the foreign law clause, I want you to agree that there are differences in language. If you do that, I'm actually, I'm actually feeling pretty good. So the first language in taxonomy is officers of United States. And this refers to appointed positions in the executive and judicial branches. This is used in four clauses of the Constitution, the Appointment Clause, the Impeachment Clause, the Oath Clause, the Commission Clause. Okay? Now according to Justice Story, Justice Story's commentaries, such positions derive their appointment from and under the national government and not the people of the United States. In other words, such officers are appointed under the Appointments Clause. They are not elected. The text and history of the Constitution confirm that story was correct. This important and frequently litigated category of positions is limited to executive branch and judicial branch appointed officers. So first, we have the Appointments Clause. It spells out with clarity that the President can nominate ambassadors, other public ministers and consuls, judges of the Supreme Court, and all other officers of the United States. Under a bigger canon, Richard, the Jusum Generis, how do you pronounce it? You got it right. Okay, the Jusum Generis. Good, I'm right here. Just talk. <laughs> no, it's here. Under this canon of the Jusum Generis, all other officers of the United States should be read to be referring to the same kind of executive and judicial branch officers that the clause expressly lists. All these officers are appointed, not elected. Second, we have the impeachment clause. The impeachment clause provides the president, vice president, and civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment. Justice Story explained that the president and the vice president enumeration here, in addition to all civil officers of the United States, shows that the president and vice president are not deemed officers of the United States themselves. Otherwise, the framers would have just said all other civil officers are subject to impeachment. Next, we have the oaths clause. The Oaths Clause simply enumerates the senators and representatives and the members of several state legislatures, as well as all executive and judicial officers, both of the United States and of the several states of the United States, and they will require to be bound by oath or affirmation to support this Constitution. In contrast, the president, who, whose position is not listed here, recites a different oath provided in Article 2, Section 1. For other positions that are not covered by Article 6, including the Secretary of the Senate and clerk of the House and their staff, Congress will create votes by statute. Now, finally, we have the Commission's Clause, right? The Commission's Clause provides that all the officers of the United States receive presidential commission. Remember, Martin versus Madison, right? Guy never got his commission. All means all. This structure explains why appointed executive branch and judicial branch officers receive commissions, but there's no record of any elected official whether president, vice president, or member of Congress, ever receiving a commission. The reason is simple. Elected officials, like the president, are not officers of the United States. 
This is the easiest one. You should be with me now. If you disagree with this one, we can talk later. But this, this one, we should probably be on the same page. Next one gets a little bit trickier. So now we move out in our circle. We were discussing officers of the United States, and we move to the next set. Office under. And just pay attention. Officer versus office. They're different words. They do make a difference. So I've explained that the phrase officers of the United States is a relatively narrow set of positions. Appointed judicial branch positions and executive branch officers. By contrast, the Foreign Emoluments Clause uses the phrase office under the United States. This refers to any federal appointed position that is created, regularized, or defeasible by statute in any of the three branches of the federal government. That includes the legislative branch. Office under the United States, as the circle suggests, is broader than officers, I'm sorry, officers of the United States. All officers of the United States necessarily hold office under the United States. However, not all who hold office under the United States are also officers of the United States. Let me give you an example, make it easier. The clerk of the house, the clerk of the house. He holds an office under the United States, but he is not an officer of the United States. He is not nominated by the president, he does not receive a commission, he is not subject to impeachment, and his oath is not authorized by the oaths clause. Instead, he is chosen by the House, and his emoluments, that is salary, are set by statute. Conversely, the Secretary of State is an executive branch officer. He is both an officer of the United States and holds office under the United States. He is appointed by the President, receives a commission, is subject to impeachment, and his oath comes from the oath clause. Okay? With me. This understanding of the phrase, office under the United States, has a drafting convention. It has its roots back in British statutory practice, with the phrase office under the crown. The last three centuries in the Commonwealth countries, office under the crown meant no elected positions. It was appointed positions. This drafting convention reflects a self-evident aspect of government. Appointed officers are subject to removal and supervision in the normal course of their duties by higher governmental officials. By contrast, Elected officials are not subject to such supervision and are answerable primarily through elections. This drafting convention was used in colonial practice, governance of the Revolutionary Era, the Articles of Confederation, and even the framers of the, first, of the convention and the first Congress. Now, let's walk through the Constitution's clauses. There are four of them. In four clauses, the Constitution uses the phrase office under the United States. First, we have the incompatibility clause which provides that no person holding any office under the United States may serve in either the House or the Senate. This office under the United States language applies to federal appointed positions created by statute in all three branches. The primary purpose of the incompatibility clause was to prevent the president from bribing members of Congress from being president. The framers saw the English Constitution as corrupt because the king could bribe members of parliament with lucrative offices. But the king never bribed members of parliament by making them king. Likewise, the president cannot bribe members of Congress with the position of making them president. This was an ethics provision and not a separation of powers provision. The three other clauses that use this phrase office under the United States with variance, and I'll explain the variance along the way. First, we have the disqualification clause. This provision allows Congress to bar impeached officers from prospectively holding any office of honor, trust, or profit on the United States. Okay, Josh, what does honor, trust, or profit? I'll give you one at a time. An office of profit refers to a position with a regular salary or other emoluments, fees, commissions, etc. At the time of the founding, a lot of officials didn't have salaries or paid by fees. An office of trust refers to a position with regular non deductible <coughs> duties that requires exercise discretion. Now, what's an office of honor? <coughs> this is a position without a fixed salary and perhaps no duties. It's basically an honorific position, and such positions do exist. Okay? That Congress can impose separate disqualifications to those who hold office under the United States affirms the conclusion that this latter category is separate from elected officials. The second clause, or actually the third clause, I should say, is the elector and incompatibility clause. This prevents a senator or representative from holding an office of profit or trust under the United States from serving as an elector, that is, a member of the Electoral College. 
Listing senators and representatives alongside those who hold office under the United States again reaffirms the conclusion that the office under the United States category was separate from elected officials. Finally, we come to the Foreign Emoluments Clause, which limits the receipt of foreign presence and emoluments for a person holding any office of profit or trust under the United States. In his commentary, Justice Story explained that the president is not an officer of the United States. I think we all agree there. It's actually, people don't agree, but I think most of us do. In the very same passage, Story also indicated that the same position applies to the Constitution's office under the United States language. In other words, the Constitution's general officer of the United States and office under the United States language does not reach the presidency. Only express constitutional language reaches the presidency. And Justice Scalia's opinion in Franklin versus Massachusetts makes this point in a slightly different fashion, but I think this is a good principle. So now we come to our next category, right? We did officers of the United States. We did office under the United States. Now we have the, the, the salmon pink, I don't know, this, this pink circle, office <coughs> under the authority of the United States. And these phrases have different meanings. And we see this in a provision in Article 6. I'm sorry, Article 1, Section 6, Clause 2. Okay? This contains both the ineligibility clause and the compatibility clause. And just read it straight through. It says, no senator shall, during the time for which he was elected, be appointed to any civil office under the authority of the United States, which shall have been created, or the emoluments whereof shall have been increased during such a time. Semicolon. And no person holding any office under the United States shall be a member of either house during his continuance in office. This provision illustrates how the framers distinguished between office under the United States and office under the authority of the United States. That the framers used both phrases, different language, in the same sentence confirms they had distinct meanings. These are not interchangeable phrases. The broader category, office under the authority of the United States, includes appointed positions in all three branches of government, that is, includes all offices under the United States. It also includes positions that are not necessarily subject to regular federal supervision, nor are they necessarily created by federal statute. It is my favorite example of the entire talk. Congress issues a letter of mark and reprisal. Oh, now I got your attention, right? If Congress issues a letter of mark and reprisal to a ship captain on a civilian vessel, that officer would be an officer under the authority of the United States. He's not an officer of the United States, who was appointed by the president. He has no office under the United States, he's not in Congress, right? But he's an officer under the authority of the United States. Now, under the ineligibility clause, a member of Congress who voted to create, I'm sorry, to issue this letter of mark and reprisal would then be ineligible for receiving that letter. The same principle applies to more routine circumstances where a member of Congress, for example, seeks to serve in a position he voted to create, or for which he voted to increase the emoluments thereof. The ineligibility clause prohibits, for a limited time, such second career. Okay, so let's move on. We have one more category, a little green circle. If you notice, the green circle is not touching the pink circle because there's not an overlap. And that's, Seth and I spent a lot of time this diagram. I think I got it right. So the final provision is public trust under the United States. And this appears in what's called the Religious Test Clause, which I never read, but I'll read it to you now. This is the broadest category of positions within the federal government. And the Religious Test Clause says, no religious test shall ever be required as a qualification to any office or public trust under the United States. This category, office, I'm sorry, the category office under the United States extends to all appointed federal officers. And the category office for public trust on the United States extends to all elected federal officials. This category includes all federal positions, both appointed and elected. Critically, all the prior categories, officers of the United States, office under the United States, office under the authority of the United States, exclude elected positions. They don't embrace positions that stand for election, such as representatives and senators and the president as it were. However, these positions do fall within Article VI, Article VI grouping of office or public trust on the United States, right? These languages matter. The framers use this language quite deliberately. Now, I concede that this taxonomy is a bit unnatural, right? Most people read the Constitution, if they ever read it, assume that all these words, officer, offices, under, whatever, mean the same thing. But there is a methodology here, 
and Professor Will Bode, who wrote about this before the election, said, Tillman's arguments have shifted the burden of proof to those who claim the present subject of foreign emoluments clause. We've shifted the burden of proof and we await response. Now this is the first part of my talk. The second part of my talk focuses on practice, specifically the practices of the presidents during the early republic, as well as Alexander Hamilton, confirmed that they understood that the president was not subject to the foreign emoluments clause. So we've got some more pictures now. Okay. In 1791, George Washington, President Washington, received, accepted, and kept a diplomatic gift, <coughs> a framed, full-length portrait of King Louis XVI from the French ambassador to the United States. There is no evidence that Washington ever saw it or received congressional consent to keep this valuable gift. In addition to the portrait, Washington also received a key, the main key to the Bastille, along with a picture. And it was given to him with my part. It was given to him by the Marquis de Lafayette, who at the time was a French government official. Lest anyone think that the key was merely a private gift between Washington and Lafayette, who were close friends, this gift was discussed in diplomatic communications from the French government representatives of the United States to superiors in the French Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who did a homework on this. Both of these items were prominently displayed in the federal capital. In fact, you go to Mount Vernon, you still see these on display today. The portrait and the valuable ornate frame, which include the Washington family crest and the monogram of the French king, to quote, embody amicable Franco-American relations hung in Washington's principal room in the federal capital. And to this day, again, you can see the key at Mount Vernon. If you ever take the tour, it's right by the staircase. The foreign provenance of these gifts from foreign governments would have been immediately recognizable to anyone who saw them. Indeed, the provenance of the key was reported in contemporaneous newspapers. If the Foreign Emoluments Clause applies to the president, then the president is precludes from accepting not just emoluments, but also any present of any kind, whatever, from foreign states, absent congressional consent. Yet, there is no record of Washington seeking or receiving congressional consent. Nor is there any evidence of any dissent, dissent in Congress among anti-administration members, dissent in newspapers, or any dissent in private correspondences. Washington's decision to accept these items, and is doing so without any recorded objection, or any objection among subsequent scholars, are strong evidence that no one thought he had done anything wrong that has violated the Foreign Emoluments Clause. Until the recent litigation, where the uh, plaintiffs have said President Trump violated these clauses, uh, uh, no one even thought of these issues. But now they've actually gone up and asserted that Washington was corrupt, and that his conduct should not be accepted. Um, the Supreme Court has recognized over and over again that George Washington's conduct, especially his public acts, is entitled to special solicitude when construing the Constitution. Uh, I humbly submit parties bear a heavy burden in asserting that Washington did not understand the Constitution helped to define. As Akhil Amar observed, Washington defined the archetypal presidential role, and as America's first man, he set precedence from his earliest moment in the job. Given that the plaintiffs are effectively alleging that Washington publicly violated the Constitution, absent any opposition, the burden of them is even heavier. But this wasn't just President Washington. We also have President Jefferson. President Jefferson received a gift. It was a bust of Tsar Alexander I, a diplomatic gift, from the Russian government. You call it Russian collusion back in the 1800s. <laughs> There's no special counsel back then. Uh, Jefferson received, accepted, and kept this diplomatic gift. In fact, Jefferson's particular esteem for Alexander, quote, convinced him to break his personal rule of not accepting gifts from public office. There is no indication that Jefferson felt his decision was in any way controlled by the Foreign Emoluments Clause. As with Washington, there's no evidence Jefferson ever sought or received congressional consent to keep the bust. Jefferson also accepted many gifts from the Indian tribes, considered these diplomatic gifts from foreign nations. During the Great Trek, Meriwether Lewis and William Clark exchanged many gifts with the Indian tribe in diplomatic and social contexts. Lewis and Clark ultimately delivered many of these gifts to Jefferson. Jefferson did not seek or receive congressional consent to keep these gifts. He put them on public display in Monticello, where they remain to this day. What all these presidents from foreign states had in common was that the presidential recipient believed, as best as we can tell, that keeping the presidents had no constitutional implications under the Foreign Emoluments Clause. Further, unlike Washington, who had a close personal relationship with Lafayette, Jefferson kept diplomatic gifts from the Tsar. 
and perform any leaders, all people he had never met. Further, unlike Washington, who was unanimously elected twice to the Electoral College, Jefferson had political opponents, especially involving foreign corruption, <coughs> nothing changes, who would report and object to malfeasance. Now, the next piece of evidence concerns Hamilton. In 1792, the Senate directed Washington's Secretary of State, Alexander Hamilton, my name is, yeah, Alexander Hamilton to draft a financial statement listing, quote, the emoluments of every person holding any civil office or employment under the United States. As you'll notice, this language tracks pretty closely, not exactly, pretty closely the language in the Foreign Emoluments Clause. Hamilton took more than nine months to draft and submit a response, which spanned 90 manuscript-style pages. Now, critically, the report listed, the report listed, this is important, appointed personnel in each of the three branches of government, including the legislative branch, that is Secretary of the Senate, the Clerk of the House, and the Clerk of the Federal Courts. But Hamilton's carefully worded response did not include the President, Vice President, Senators, or Representatives. The editors of the papers of Alexander Hamilton <coughs> marked this document DS, which meant document signed. They thought, we thought, this document was signed by Hamilton. So we have a Senate request. They asked for a list of every person holding a civil office or employment under the United States. And that is precisely what Hamilton delivered, to the exclusion of any elected officials. If the Constitution's office under the United States language reached elected officials, then quite plainly, Hamilton misunderstood the meaning of the Constitution's language, which used language which he helped draft and ratify. Is it again counterintuitive to suggest that Hamilton misunderstood this frequently used language? The better reading is that Hamilton accurately responded to the Senate's precise request. Elected officials do not hold office under the United States, so they were not listed. Now, we look at a kerfuffle with this. Um, a number of uh, legal historians asserted that uh, we, Seth and I, misled the court, that we were relying on a document that was not the only document, that there was another document signed by Hamilton. Uh, we wrote in our brief that this other document was drafted by an unknown Senate functionary and we don't know when it was signed, and it was not signed by Hamilton. Uh, they made the mistake of putting this in court pleading. It did not turn out so well for them. Uh, so let me just show you the documents here. This is what Hamilton's signature looks like. It was a very flowing signature, right? Uh, here, here's another version of it, right? At the very bottom, oh no, this, this, this is the real one, okay? This is not Hamilton's signature. Can anyone even spot where on this document the Hamilton signature is, right? Again, I'll show the one, two. Here's Hamilton's signature, very distinct, very pronounced. This is the other document that Hamilton signed. Can you see it? That was really closely. Yeah. Here, here's one. Here's two. <laughs> Anyone see it? It's sort of in the middle something. Yeah. Yeah. So ready? Except when it's over there on the right. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm going to point over here, right? This little thing on zoom in, you can barely even read it. So this is a document that some people asserted um, was actually Hamilton's signature. So what did we do? We got the affidavits of five experts who verify Hamilton documents. And we submitted a very long plea to the court explaining why they were in error. And to their credit, they apologized. That was very nice of them. They not only apologized, but they withdrew their pleading. They actually withdrew a footnote from their brief where they basically asserted that we were misleading the court. This doesn't happen very often. Um, and I think it's an important lesson uh, uh, among legal historians who don't like lawyers, um, they don't know everything, right? They don't, and sometimes we have the goods. Um, so again, if you doubt me, we've been researching this, by we have mostly Seth, I'm merely his messenger, I'm like, you know, it's Joshua, it's Moses, right? I'm merely his messenger, <laughs> <laughs> quite literally. Uh, Seth is very mosaic, he's a, he's a tablet, he's really cool. So, um, but as it were, those who doubt us do so at their own peril. There's a lot of stuff here that hasn't been rebutted. There's a lot of stuff here that hasn't been rebutted, and we have stuff we haven't shown yet. In fact, we've been anticipating certain arguments being made that haven't been made yet, and whether they're made, we'll have stuff to go. Um, there are other issues here which I just don't have time to discuss, uh, which includes the domestic emoluments clause. This applies to the president without any questions, right? No, no doubt about this, but what is an emolument, right? What does that actually mean? Uh, there are also some pleading issues. Professor Hemmel joined a brief uh, with a number of federal court scholars arguing that this was properly brought in federal courts. 
we raise in our pleadings that this is not properly pleaded against the president in his official capacity. It only concerns individual capacity arguments. The judge in Maryland seemed to agree with us. The plaintiffs then amended their complaint, brought individual capacity claims, but there's a problem. They don't have a cause of action. You can only sue a federal official if there's no cause of action. It's the Bivens Doctrine. Yes, the Bivens Doctrine. There's no implied cause of action for the emoluments clauses. No one heard of these things until five months ago, right? So I think this litigation could have dead end very soon, either based on our arguments or our arguments. Um, the government hasn't done the best job defending the president, it's unfortunate, but they've recently retained Will Consovoy, who I think is very respected. He will present President Trump in his individual capacity. His co-counsel is Jen Mascott, who is one of the leaders on uh, corpus linguistics. Uh, so I think the president's ready to roll. Uh, I'm gonna stop here, I think I've spoken enough, and turn to my good friend Dan. And uh, I'm going to shut up, but thank you all so much, and it's always a pleasure to be in Chicago. Thanks. I uh, really appreciate you coming here to educate us on the emoluments clauses. Um, I can't claim vast expertise on this, so I'll just shoot off a few thoughts. Um, when we were last talking in this room, I guess it was November, I believe it was November 7th, 2016. So if you had told me that a year and a half later we would be discussing the Foreign Emoluments Clause, I would have thought, first I would have checked what the Foreign Emoluments Clause was, and then I would have thought, yeah, you know, the gifts from the King of Morocco to the Clinton Foundation <laughs> do raise some difficult questions. <laughs> I think. Uh, there are a few broad areas of agreement between me and uh, Josh. The first is uh, the Constitution has red zones, things that the President clearly cannot do. And then the Constitution has green zones, things that we might think that the President ought not do. Get rid of personal exemptions on individual income tax returns. But there's obviously no constitutional issue there. And then there's an orange zone uh, of Violations of constitutional norms that are not judicially enforceable, uh, but if we were the chief of staff to the president and advising him on this, we would say don't do that and this recommendation sounds in a different register than our don't repeal personal exemptions recommendation. It is a violation of a core norm of a democratic policy. Uh, so a good example of a norm that I think we would both agree is in the orange zone would be uh, you should not use, as president, your Twitter account or your bully pulpit to try to drive down the stock price of a company whose CEO happens to be the publisher of a newspaper that's printing negative stories. <laughs> right? We would both agree you should not do that. You should not do that in a different way than you should not get rid of personal exemptions or the salt deduction. Um, but there's nothing that a court can do about this. And I think we would also both agree that President Trump's maintenance of control over the Trump Organization as president is either an orange zone or a red zone issue. It is not a green zone issue. I think I agree orange. Yeah. Uh, and I would I would maintain red, but we but we both agree yeah. that this is either constitutionally constitutionally problematic or constitutionally prohibited. Um, second, I think we would both agree uh, that the definition of emolument is a really tough question. It can't be the case that the president violates the domestic emoluments clause when he invests in treasury bonds. Right? If he decides that I'm just going to put my money in treasury bonds. Except if emolument means receipt of any income from anyone, well, that would be an emolument from the United States above his statutory compensation. And you'd be getting interest on treasury. Is it constitutionally problematic if the president invests in a Vanguard fund that owns uh, tax-exempt muni bonds uh, or bonds issued by foreign governments? I don't know. Those are tough questions, right? Um, uh, was it um, a violation of the Foreign Emoluments Clause when the British Library uh, bought copies of Audacity of Hope uh, while President Obama was in office, or bought copies of Profiles and Courage when President Kennedy was in office. Those are really tough questions. Right? Emolument has to mean something. And if we use the intratextualist uh, modality of interpretation that Josh and Seth are pushing here, 
um, then I think we would lead to we would we would end up with the um, conclusion that uh, any payment for services is an amount, right? Um, because the uh, we, we would um, we were we say that the uh, member of Congress cannot serve in a cabinet post if they've raised the emoluments from uh, from that. Their emoluments really means compensation for services, fair market. Uh, so that that leads to uh, potentially I don't want to say absurd results. I don't think it would be absurd to say that President Obama had to stop receiving royalties on Audacity of Hope, at least from public libraries uh, while he was in office. But these are difficult questions. I think we disagree on whether the Emoluments Clause applies to uh, the President, and I'll, um, I'll try to run through six points here. Um, the first is, first I should say, this is unresponsive to the merits of the plaintiff's claims in Crew versus Trump and DC and Maryland versus Trump, because they are uh, asserting violations of both the foreign and domestic Emoluments Clauses. And, uh, in the Maryland and D.C. case, which is the one that has passed the motion of dismiss stage in the District of Maryland. It's the domestic emoluments clause where they're putting a lot of weight. Both. Right. They, their, their particular status as, well, in one case, states, uh, gives greater force to the federalist component of the domestic emoluments clause. Right? This is a federalism provision in that we don't want one state to be able to buy off the president as it can. It's also a little bit strange to think that the framers wanted to prohibit the states from giving emoluments to the president, but were like totally okay with foreign governments giving emoluments to the president, but not with foreign governments giving emoluments to any appointed official across the federal government. And Josh said at the very beginning that intuition is not argument, but those trained in analytic philosophy think that actually intuition, intuition is argument, right? Or intuition is the source of data that we use for arguments. So uh, the, the right to keep and bear arms, uh, I, I intuitively do not believe that that uh, creates a broad right to uh, go sleeveless, right? Um, but I'm relying on intuition that that couldn't possibly have been what the framers meant. Right? So if our interpretation of the Foreign Emoluments Clause and the Domestic Emoluments Clause at the same time leads to really strange results, then I think that intuition ought to matter. Um, second, uh, I, I'm not sure that the textual inferences that you draw uh, work. So um, imagine the following. Uh, Members of the University of Chicago law school faculty must submit winter quarter grades to the deputy dean by 5 p.m. on Monday, April 9th. <laughs> Does that imply that the deputy dean is not a member of the faculty of the University of Chicago law school? Based on your reading of officers of the United States, yes. Uh, but. Dean Nababa definitely is a member of the University of Chicago Law School faculty, and I definitely do need to send in my grades uh, by 5 p.m. today. <laughs> um, so the, the, the fact that the Constitution uses president and vice president and officers of the United States without other officers of the United States does not necessarily imply that the president and the vice president are not officers of the United States. Um, uh, Anthony Rizzo and all the members of the Chicago Cubs will be showing up at my apartment tonight, come over. Right? That's not implying that Anthony Rizzo is not a member of uh, the Chicago Clubs. I just want, uh, Chicago Cubs, I just want to put a particular emphasis on him. Um, third, the, uh, the results of this do seem absurd beyond just the interaction between uh, the Domestic Emoluments Clause and the Foreign Emoluments Clause. So I think by your interpretation, and tell me if I'm misreading, uh, if Donald Trump challenges Chuck Schumer in the New York Senate election, he could serve in the U.S. Senate. He's still a resident of New York, he could. So, so I would say QED there, right? That's, uh, based, on your, right based on your interpretation of the Constitution, the president can serve in the Senate simultaneously. Right. I have a response to this, but I'll give you later. Okay, I, that seems to me like a really big bullet to, to fight. Now, New York sucks. <laughs> Fourth, I think it's hard to believe that the framers wrote in code. 
in intertextualism is a useful source of data about what the framers might have meant by a particular provision. Okay, we know what this language means here. That gives us some evidence as to what it means in a different place. But different clauses of the Constitution had different authors. And why would they have, why would they have done this? Right? Writing in code uh, a document that was public and publicly debated. It's a little bit strange that if this pattern exists across the Constitution, Joseph Story starts talking about it several decades later, uh, but it wasn't made apparent for ratification conventions. So we've got a lot of data on what people thought the Constitution meant, right? and missing, uh, at the time, and missing from Josh's extraordinary canvassing of the history of the interpretation of the Emoluments Clause. This is anything from the time of the Constitution's writing or ratification. It's only post-ratification history. Uh, fifth, I find the Washington did it argument entirely unpersuasive. Right? Washington, uh, or, or that Adams did it, or that Jefferson did it. Right? Adams signed the Alien and Sedition Act. Like there goes the First Amendment. Uh, they recently written a constitution. Um, the constitution had a whole bunch of clauses, some of which they probably vaguely remembered. There was a lot going on. They were trying to build a country here. Washington probably escaped criticism for lots of things that future presidents wouldn't escape criticism for because of his uh, uh, kind of status above uh, the political warring factions. Um, I mean, by the time of Jackson, the understanding that the Emoluments Clause applied to the president seems to have been uh, at least accepted by Congress, right? When the Colombian president, Simone Bolivar, gave gold medals to Jackson, Congress passed a law saying, Emoluments Clause says that we have to give consent for this. We don't give consent and need to deposit with us. Right? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, my understanding is that uh, Benjamin Harrison got approval from Congress first, first president ever. Uh, for receipt of emoluments from Brazil and Spain. Kennedy asked the Office of Legal Counsel for an opinion on whether he could become an Irish citizen. And the Office of Legal Counsel at the Justice Department said, no, it is the Alliance Clause applies to the President. So it's funny that we, we look at post-ratification history for a little bit, and then we stop. Um, and then finally, uh, the, the Hamilton letter. So you're totally right that Jed Sugarman and others who criticized you for this were off base. That said, this, if this is your smoking gun, right? Uh, then, then there's really no fire uh, there. So Congress asked uh, Hamilton for a list of people with civil offices under the United States. Right? Um, if I ask for a, you know, can you name the members of Trump's cabinet, I assume you would start with Mike Pence or with who's the Secretary of State today? Pompeo. Pompeo has been confirmed But if you didn't start with Trump, that wouldn't be an inference that Trump's not a member of Trump's cabinet. It's just, that was obvious, right? Uh, the members of Congress voted on the president's salary, so they knew the president's salary, right? They were omitted from this because like, they knew who they were, right? So it was, Hamilton was writing a 90-page document. I don't know if that's evidence that this was super comprehensive and the fact that he left out the president and the vice president and the members of Congress. Uh, it means that he didn't think that they were officers of the United States, or like, geez, he's gone on for 90 pages now, he doesn't need to state the obvious uh, in addition. Um, all right, uh, at the very end, uh, uh, Josh said some provocative things about the lack of a cause of action and whether this is an official capacity or an unofficial capacity claim. Um, look, Free Enterprise Fund versus PCOB recognizes that there's a cause of action under separation of powers provisions under the Constitution. The Foreign Emoluments Clause is a separation of powers provision, right? It allocates to Congress the ability to decide whether officers or officers under, those holding offices under the United States can accept emoluments. Uh, so just as a hedge fund uh, can sue the PCOB and the SEC for violations of the Appointments Clause, so too, uh, individuals who meet the otherwise applicable requirements for Article Three standing can have a cause of action for violation of, of a separation of powers provision. I think there's a difficult Article Three standing question, but actually not a difficult cause of action question. Uh, and this transcends the official capacity, personal capacity 
distinction. The, the plaintiff's claim in these suits uh, is that President Trump, qua president, has arrogated to himself the power to decide whether Donald Trump, as businessman, can accept emoluments. Right? So in one sense, it's an official capacity claim, because it's Trump, you used your power as president, disregarded Congress, allowed this, what they say is illegal competition, to occur. An official capacity claim generally binds your successor. But, but that doesn't make any sense here, because President Trump's successor as president, well, at that point, Trump wouldn't be president, so there would be no, no problem, right? Unless Trump goes, if Trump becomes vice president or secretary of state, then I guess we would want to bind uh, Trump's successor. Or, yeah, senator from New York, which uh, <laughs> appears to be permissible. Um, but I think there are probably, uh, there may be more areas of agreement than disagreement between us here, particularly on the difficulty uh, of the emoluments question, which I think will be the, the core question uh, at the merit stage and certainly where uh, much of the um, Department of Justice's fire is now focused. So thanks for making the trip. Thank you. For, for all of the recordings that Dan and your faculty, please, if you haven't taken one of class, I wish I could take your class. I'd be recording this all day, every day. So he said six points. I counted at least nine, but I'll give all of them. Um, the first one took Dan less than a minute to mention salt deduction. I swear, this is what he lives and breathes on. I, I, even even at the airport, it's snowing. There's salt in Chicago, you know. So, <laughs> um, so let me start off. He made a point that said, "How could it be that Congress was concerned about the states giving the president emolument, uh, but not foreign governments?" This is actually an important point. He referenced the issue of medals. Let me give you an example. Let's say the president of some new republic, let's call it Colombia, gives President Madison a gift and says. Dear Mr. President, I give you these pistols as a gift of appreciation between two nations. Madison had not yet recognized a nation as a country. To accept that gift or to go to Congress and seek permission could be deemed an act of recognition. And whether you agree with Zivotofsky or not, I don't care. It's probably wrongly decided. The recognition power does constitute the acceptance of a gift. That is, the acceptance of a gift, an emolument, could itself be an act of recognition. Um, it doesn't surprise me that the framers put a different sphere for the president in foreign relations where he has some unchecked power, relatively. And I don't care if you like Zivotofsky or not. I think it was probably wrong. I read Thomas, but we'll, we'll leave it there. Second, um, these are intellectual inferences. Um, there are certain phrases that are used in the Constitution that we don't think of that much, like bill of attainder. I don't think what that phrase actually means, but at the time frame, people knew what a bill of attainder was. That was a phrase that people would often discuss. And if you look at hundreds of years of British drafting practices, hundreds of years of British drafting practices, office under the crown had a meaning. It is used in state constitutions. It's used in Continental Congress. It's used very consistently. It was used so much, it didn't need to go remarked upon. Like, we didn't have Brian Garner back then telling us on language, right? So these people who are learning the law would just understand. Now, Dan's right. Under our theory, there's nothing stopping the president from running for Congress. I mean, the president could be senator, because have appointed by the state, but in theory, he could run for the House. Not a, not, not a problem like that. Um, there was a good article by Steve Calabrese and Joan Larson, who's now on the Sixth Circuit, uh, where they explained that the uh, uh, incompatibility clause is an ethics provision, not a separation of powers provision. And it was designed to prevent the president from bribing officers with positions. If the president himself wants to run for the House, uh, he could do it. Uh, we admit this is a weird holding, but it's something I think there are other structural problems with. I'll give you an example. Akhil Mar wrote that as a textual matter, the vice president should preside as own impeachment trial. Right? As a textual matter, the VP presides as own impeachment trial. That's a big conflict of interest. So I think there might be other limitations on Donald Trump challenging Chuck Schumer for the Senate beyond the incompatibility clause. Uh, Dan said, it's hard to believe the framers wrote in code. Um, again, these were phrases that were fairly well understood, um, and, and they didn't need to be remarked upon. Now the George Washington, I love when he brings up the Alien Station Act. Um, the Alien Station Act were really unpopular, right? President Jefferson thought they were unconstitutional. He and Madison wrote these statements and these were really bad things. Usually people say, the Judiciary Act of 1789, right? Margaret versus Madison, right? They struck down an act of the first Congress. Well, like Steve Laddick, I'm probably coming wrong, but we'll leave that aside for now. 
No one objected to these acts, and there were a lot of these acts, not only by Washington, who had wide popularity, but by Jefferson, who had a lot of detractors. There's the musical Hamilton, right? There was a lot of bad blood going on back then. Okay? Next, we get to Jackson. I'm so glad that Dan brought this up. Um, the plaintiffs have advanced Andrew Jackson, who they say asked Congress permission to keep gifts from, from a, a Latin American uh, revolutionaries, whatever. If you actually check the congressional record, he never asked to keep them. He said, dispose of them. He was giving them to Congress. Only one house voted. You have similar practices from Van Buren and from Tyler. They never asked to keep these gifts personally. Ditto for Lincoln. He never asked to keep the gifts as well. The first president, was it Harrison in 1898? No, 1902 or 310? Harrison? Yeah. 1888. Eight, no, 1892. Right, 18, right. President Benjamin Harrison, after he was out of office, asked Congress to accept the foreign gift. The guy wasn't even president anymore, right? He wasn't even president anymore when this happened. So look, you have to go all the way to Kennedy in OLC, who said, no, you can't accept the citizenship. He was assassinated, right? So he never actually had the issue. Then you go back to Obama, where is uh, uh, Judge, oh, what's his name, David on the First Circuit, um, Barron. David Barron wrote this opinion saying that the Foreign Emoluments Clause surely applies to the president. There's no evidence, it's surely. And, and uh, you have the Congressional Research Service, which used to think it applied, but now they somewhat changed position in response to Seth's work. Uh, the Hamilton language, no, this is, this is not our smoking gun. We mentioned this in a footnote. Uh, I only bring it up to show the fact that we have some stuff on our side to give us some thought. Um, to respond to Dan's point, why would you list the president? There are other lists. Oh, there are other lists. And other lists do list the president's salary. So in some lists, Hamilton put the president's salary. He didn't do it here. Again, this was a very meticulous guy. You have to call Washington a crook and Hamilton a fool. I am doing neither. So we come to the cause of action, which I very casually sneaked at the end because I wanted to get Dan to talk about this. Uh, he mentioned the Free Enterprise Fund. That was a case about official government action. I have no problem under the separation of powers to have an official cause of action implied by the Constitution. That's always okay. But we're talking here individual causes of action, right? With, if I want to sue a FBI agent for beating me up, I have to rely on Bivens. I can't rely on the structure of the Constitution, right? If it's an official capacity action, I can sue, a, say, a federal department for engaging in discriminatory hiring practices, whatever, right? But for private, individual conduct, you need Bivens. You need an implied cause of action. And I look to your attention of Ziegler versus Abbasi. It was a four to three decision decided last term, where I think the court basically shut the door on implied cause of action. Again, it was four three, we can argue what that means. Justice Kagan was recused, Sotomayor was recused, Scalia was gone. I mean, there was not a majority. I'll, I'll give you that, I'll concede that point. But I think where the court's headed is it's a narrow implied cause of action. So free enterprise fund doesn't get you where you need to go. They also raised bond versus the United States. That's a criminal prosecution. You don't need a cause of action for criminal prosecutions. Okay. Um, the last part I want to address very briefly, and I'll give it back to Dan for a bit, is that what happens if President Trump resigns, right? Would that cure the emoluments clause violation? I think there's absolutely not. Why? One of them might be disgorgement, right? If indeed President Trump is violating this clause, which I don't think he is, a remedy a court could order in equity, assuming it applies to the president, would be disgorgement of assets. And if, say, if Trump, oh God, Secret Service, something happens, we no longer president, right? You go after his estate. Humphrey's executor, right? So this case doesn't go away if Mike Pence becomes president. In fact, I don't think it goes away if Trump is impeached or resigns or whatever happens to be. The case, I think, would continue in Tampa Street, the litigants, whether it's the King of Morocco or, or Russia, this litigation will go either way. But I think the suit does proceed. So there are, there are problems here involving federal courts. And if a court is so much tedious on the standing, I think we can dump it on the federal court's grounds. Um, I think that'll be your point, Sam. I, I missed one, you can raise your point. I think I had one. Did I miss anything? Uh, I hope I got to miss anything. Well, I might say that some of the, some of the counter arguments weren't entirely responsive. Uh, but, but, but I didn't mean to say that. I didn't well, miss anything. I addressed I mean, it. But let's, um, yeah, I mean, we've got, right locker, we've go got 10 minutes left. Uh, so why don't we open up the floor I, okay, to, uh, um, All right. to student questions All right, that so are probably directed at Professor Blackman, but I'm happy please, to. Yeah, and if you need to go, just, just, just go for it. But I'll be here as long as you need. Questions? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, thank you uh, very much for coming. I guess 
my first question is, is getting into the end there where you're talking about how the case would go on even in the instance of whether or not President Trump were to leave office, uh, do you think that the case would then continue against him in his personal capacity? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So not yeah. No, yeah. no, that, well, that can't be right. Because, I mean, Bivens is about uh, uh, cause of action for money damages. Oh, Dan, you raise a good question. Can you get a Bivens action for injunctive relief? No, you would use ex parte young. But that's not, that's official action, it's individual here. Well, but the, the, uh, It's extra judicial. The, right, but the what 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 the plaintiffs want here is an injunction from the District of Maryland. Or they from haven't sought injunction. They, they, they have not sought injunction for it deliberately. Uh, they want a declaration. They actually. Okay, they want a declaratory judgment. No, not a death. They just want they just want a complaint. They, they're not seeking any injunctive relief. Uh, well, they're they're not asking for money, right? They're not they're not asking for Trump to pay them. Um, and it's not like a, a style as a shareholder derivative action where they're calling for Trump to pay disgorgement to the federal government. What they, what they want is, and we haven't gotten to the remedy stage yet, uh, but I think they, they've got boilerplate language about whatever relief is appropriate, yeah, which, is, which is quite common in civil litigation in federal courts. Uh, but what they want is, an, ultimately, an order from the court saying that Trump Hotel can't compete with uh, the Walter Washington Convention Center and uh, the Bethesda Marriott that uh, Maryland owns a piece of, and the national, the, the Maryland properties at National Harbor. Right. Um, what the what the plaintiffs in the New York case want is it's like Danny Meyer, owner of the Modern, wants part owner. Um, okay, part owner. There's actually a verification. They did a pleading error there also. I think I think Danny Meyer might own the entire Modern now. Uh, but 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 I believe actually all of the modern is part of uh, Rock United. Uh, but they they want an order saying that there's an emoluments clause violation when diplomats go and get John George. Right. That and, and that would not be the case once President Trump is no longer in office. Right. So there'd be nothing to ask Trump's estate for. They're not saying that Trump's estate has to pay modern for the meals that were eaten by John George. And so in that in that sense, it, it does seem to be a case that dies with that. Ends with, <laughs> that ends with the end of Trump occupying an office of profit or trust. I'll, I'll leave it there because I think Richard had that. But I, there, there are some arguments that have been far too long and out of time, but we can, I'll develop this later. Richard? Yeah, uh, this is for both of you. Uh, the question about the Trump activities that are still normally under his control is being either an orange or a red. I'd like to hear why orange and you and why red. Yeah. So we put this in our brief. We say this up front. We think that President Trump's actions are not good government. We, we say this very candidly. And, and for those who write that, I'm a Trump apologist, if we throw from the truth, like, I'm not a fan. I don't like what he's doing. Except for judges. I'm judging the guy's killing it. But otherwise, it's, there's a lot, a lot of stuff that worries me. Um, having the president accepting business profits, I don't think creates some sort of in, inherent conflict of interest. But it troubles me that businesses from foreign governments are patronizing Hotel A instead of Hotel B because of the implication they can get some sort of good favor, goodwill. As a free market person, I don't like cronyism, and this makes me feel dirty. So that's But, I don't, but the, yeah. the question is actually, in some sense, more interesting. There's nothing that Trump can do, for example, in the usual way of putting his assets in a foreign trust that will solve this problem. No, right? no. Because everybody be knows possible. that the yeah. blind trust is not going to dispose of all of this. Yeah. So the traditional device of blind trust management diversification doesn't work. And so uh, is it perfectly clear that he has to divest everything in order to become president of the United States? That's a question for And, and, and I, I don't, I mean, Dan's a corporal. I don't know if he could divest everything in two months. I think that these are such complicated transactions. He was elected in November and inaugurated in January. I don't think he could divest. I mean, I've talked to lawyers who looked at this, said that it would be physically impossible for him to divest all the assets. Well, my guess would take years to actually understand, but we are yeah. And by the way, even as he's divesting, of course, he's going to show favoritism to his company. He's going to show it in order to increase the price of divestment. So I think there's a kind of impossibility exception to the normal rule that might apply here. So, Dan, what's your response? So, I mean, it, it, there's no impossibility exception, right? You can sell Trump organization. There's a mountain. I, mean, I would pay. Uh, I'll pay $100 million for Trump organization, right? I don't know how much it's worth, but you can, you can change ownership of Trump organization pretty quickly. 
Oh, you sell really big. And 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 that strikes me as clearly wrong. That's right. Well, <laughs> you sell big companies quickly. No, you don't. No, and, no. As a corporate matter, when you have a company whose brand name is its critical asset, and you sell it, and you have to change. Weinstein. Yeah. Well, you don't sell it. You go bankrupt. Yes. But the impossibility exception is always built into all sorts of rules on statutory construction. It's extremely difficult to divest a company that is a closed corporation relative to a minority interest in a publicly held company where they're organized things. Well, but one thing, you cannot just sell your shares in the same way, whereas if George Bush could certainly sell his shares in the Texas Rangers. I, as a corporate matter, this is 100 times harder. No, I, I think I, I disagree. Uh, one of the... Right. What, what makes selling a publicly traded corporation harder is you've got to let shareholders have, I mean, if it's a tender offer, you have to have a tender offer period, right? Um, but Trump could just tomorrow sell, I mean, his, his owns 99 odd percent of it, right? And he needs to get uh, his, his kids on board, but he could sell the Trump organization to whoever wants to buy. Richard Shake is a no. I mean, I'm a humble, humble you can, Ben and Jerry no. just sold to Unilever, right? You can you can have a, a company that is oriented around the personality of one or two people, uh, and you can sell it, right? So it's not, I mean that 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 might not be the way to to profit maximize, um, but it's not an impossibility. No, you, you could basically trash it, yes, but there's no way you could sell it at fair value so long as the name is inherent. And the complicated interests in which you have a dominant share. It's just too difficult to do. I keep that. Do you think Richard or Dan has a, not, has a question? Not that <laughs> Richard or Dan? <laughs> I work with students. No? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, standing. Okay, so standing is hard. Um, uh, there, there were several allegations of standing, and Dan can correct me on this something. One was by a group called Crew, which is the Citizen for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington. And they asserted standing because they had to spend resources to investigate this matter. And this is what the case called Haven's Realty. It's a case from the 70s. I'm dubious about that one. The New Yorker rejected it. Another group, group of business owners, again, they're only partial business owners. This is actually a big problem for them. Their original complaint is that these people own these companies. And then some, some of things after the complaint said, well, they are part of it. So this is that. They got problems down the road. They say because there's competitors going to Trump restaurants and Trump properties of mine, there's competitor standing. The third one, which I always thought was the strongest, was states. Under uh, what's called state solicitude in Mass versus EPA and also US v. Texas, the, the DAPA case of 10 I debated a year or two ago, uh, states have a special solicitude, especially because the state of Maryland owned uh, a, a hotel properties, they owned convention centers. Uh, the state of, uh, not state, the DC owned a convention center, which competes with Trump. The district court in Maryland held that they were standing there and they got past the first hurdle. Uh, there's also issues of political question, zone of interest. Um, the third suit, which I think is a non-starter, is called Blumenthal versus Trump. It involves 100, 200 members of Congress to the president. I think after Rainy Bird, that, that, one's, that one's not going enough to the birds, perhaps. The, 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 um, I don't, I don't, I th there was a controversy about whether Eric Good owned um, the majority sorry, the of the restaurant. Right, yeah, yeah. right. But, but I, it seems like some of the restaurant owners in New York do own their restaurants. But we can, the problems are also. Um, uh, but there, there's one woman who's a part of the DC suit. And you've raised questions about the, the factual underpinnings of the claims in her complaint. Not publicly. But, right. but the, claim, the claims in her complaint are that she books diplomatic events at the Carlisle Hotel in DuPont Circle and the Kimpton Glover Apartment. Uh, and when people have their diplomatic event, when countries have their diplomatic events at Trump, at Trump Hotel, rather than at other hotels that compete for diplomatic business. She actually loses money. She's paid on a commission for the service. Yeah, my, my, again, for purpose of a complaint, you assume the facts are true. This woman's a hedge fund manager. She's not an event planner. There's no country she's ever booked any event ever, but you assume the facts are purpose of the And I think we also both agree that women Paul versus Trump is a loser. That, that's going nowhere fast. Oh, we should have something. Should one one case. Okay, yeah, good. I I actually think we're uh, we're just about out of time. But thank okay. you, everyone. Join me in thanking our guests. <laughs>